Good morning. Welcome early birds to Renovation Church. <clears throat> I don't even know what's happening on this front row. Don't even know. My my presence from the what? Oh, I seen this. I didn't get a chance to look any further. I gotta look before I share. It's from the Twisted Sisters. You understand where I'm coming from. <laughs> oh, that I can share. It's a pen that says God bless. And it has my name on it. That's awesome. You ladies are awesome. I'm not going to lie, though. I was a little scared to open it up again. <laughs> I was a little bit intimidated. Listen, it's not about the wrapping. It's about what's inside. So uh, <laughs> we're just different here. It's all good. I'm, I'm, you know, I was studying this week, and I was just getting, I get really pumped up when I'm talking about, like, the birth of, of our Savior, because that is it. I mean, that's like the beginning of our hope. That's like what should get us, like, our blood pumping. That should get us, like, really excited at 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. I mean, that should get us really, really pumped up. Some of you are like, seriously, calm down, dude. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. I don't calm down. I, I sleep sometimes. That's when I'm calm. The rest of the time, we just get pumped up for the Lord. Amen. So, so this week, I, uh, you know, I shared last year. I shared about two different perspectives when I was I was talking about the birth of our Savior. I shared Mary's perspective and Joseph's perspective, and I think it's important that we understand their perspectives because it helps us to understand how they handled it and how Jesus changed their lives, and, and they were present right there with him, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's important to know. And, and then we have, we have, we got to continue to change our perspectives. What happens is we get caught up in this world where the world tries to give us this outline of what our lives are supposed to look like. The world tries to tell us what our perspective should be, and the world tries to point us in a direction, and nearly always nearly always is away from Jesus, not toward. And so today I want us to jump into Luke, second chapter. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and start getting it open. And I want you to jump into that. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Someone will get you one. We got a few up here. We have ordered them. They just haven't come in yet. We ordered a lot because we give out a lot. I can't think of a better thing to spend money on is getting the Word of God in people's hands. So, so we'll continue to do that. But if you need one today, raise your hand. We won't call you out. They'll get you one. We'll be good. And so I want us to kind of think about what this has looked like throughout history. Because I, I want us to understand that we, as, as a culture, have pushed Christmas into this box over time that, is, that really has very little to do with Jesus. And, and, and even in, in the church... You know, we, we, we put it into so many different places, but it, like we don't celebrate Jesus in those places like we should. And, and, you know, throughout history, you know, it's not always been December 25th when, when we celebrated the birth of, of Christ. You know, in history, January 6th was once, once when they celebrated Christmas Day. And then, you know, it was in March throughout times in, in history. And, and it's different throughout history. But the important thing is that we have a time when we, when we focus on it to kind of bring us back to ground zero. Because you know what happens the rest of the year? We kind of get lost. I almost kind of wish we could have... Christmas a couple times a year, right? To kind of bring us refocused. You know, we can do that anytime we want. It doesn't have anything to do with trees or, or presents or anything like that. We can even do it like on Sundays and Wednesdays. And, and even on Mondays and Tuesdays. We can do it anytime we want to bring our minds back to the, the reason why we have a, a reason to be happy. Without the birth of Jesus, we have zero things to be joyful for. There's, and and, and that's, that's kind of sad sounding, right? A little depressing if you're not a believer. But it should make you want to receive him even more. 
And so I want to I want to get our minds shifted this this year. I wanted to change it a little bit. I'm glad I'm kind of glad that Christmas is still like 6 days away or whatever. Because it gives us a little bit more time to focus in so on that day, on that 25th this year, maybe we can celebrate it like we've never celebrated before in our life. That we can actually celebrate the birth of our Christ. Celebrate the birth of our Savior. Celebrate Jesus like we've never celebrated before. I don't know if you're still going along with with the scripture that I shared a few weeks ago, focusing on, on the prayer and the fasting and, 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 and focusing on those things in our life and, and reading the scripture. I don't know if you're still doing that, but I would, I would challenge you to get back into that because I really want us to celebrate on the 25th in our own homes and wherever we're at as the body. Because here's what's awesome. The body comes together, but the body's still together when we're not together. You know, that, right? you know, why? You know why that is? Because Jesus is with us all. And so wherever we're at, we can celebrate the birth of our Savior together. And it's, it's strong. It can be strong. I want us to get rid of the arrogance of Christmas that our culture has put into it. We put in some arrogance into it. How much do I got to spend on this and how much do I got to spend on that? I got to make sure it's even across the board. We, I mean, we've, we, we do that in our own home. Well, we got to make sure we spend as much on this kid as we do for this kid. The arrogance of the holiday. And we don't even mean to. We just do because it's, we don't want someone to feel bad. Well, I mean, it's just one of those things where, you know, we, 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 we've gotten to the point where we don't want them to feel bad on the birth of Jesus because they didn't get as much as somebody else. That's arrogance. And we've done that and we've ingrained in ourselves and we don't think about it like that because it's kind of hard to beat ourselves up. But we kind of need to sometimes. Because the arrogance we've put into Christmas is, is so much so that, like, these priorities are far more important to us in moments, and we stress out about them far more than we do anything else. And, and instead of just saying, you know what? We're, we're going to do it different now. We're going to do it different this year. We're going to make it different. You know, I mean, you, st- you can still buy presents. There's nothing wrong with that. But how about instilling Jesus into the season like we're supposed to? Get rid of the arrogance that we bring in and really put Jesus into the center. And so we're going to look at it from a different perspective today. Not Mary and not Joseph. Obviously, they're, <laughs> they still have to be key players, right? Jesus used them. I can't change the way it actually happened. It's what happened. So we're going to be in Luke 2, verses 3 through 20. I'm just going to read through it, and then I want to talk through it with you a little bit. And I want to maybe look at it in a way that you've never looked at it before. I know when I started seeing it like this, it was just totally different for me. Last year when I looked at it from Mary and Joseph's perspective and a little different view of how I'd ever done it before, it opened my eyes and real, made me realize just how I need to be more in tune with what Jesus has for me. And so in, in verse 3, it starts off with this. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee from the city of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was out of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who he was engaged to and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, And she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because he was no room for him in the inn. In the same region, there was some shepherds starting, they were staying out in the fields and kept watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will, be, you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see the thing that has been happened, which the Lord has made known to us. 
So they came in a hurry and they found, found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known in a statement which had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it about heard it wondered about things wondered at the things that were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things up, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as has been told to them. I want us to to stop and I want us to get childlike faith today. I want us to kind of take ourselves back to when we were kids before the world beat us up. Hard to come sometimes go back to that, right? Is it hard to go back to that sometimes? I know for me, I go back to like when I was in elementary school. I, I've shared this every year. We used to sing Christmas carols before school for 30 minutes before school every single day for like the month of December until we left for Christmas break. And I miss those days. I wish my kids got to experience that. We would sing Christmas carols on these stairs in the school at Little Doling Elementary in north side of Springfield over just right smack in the ghetto. And, and we would sing Christmas carols, and these teachers were so, so nice to us. And I remember Miss Wilson, who was a tough, tough fifth grade teacher. But man, she would lead those songs, and it was, it was an awesome time. You can see the joy of the Lord in her. Now, you don't, you don't add anything to those songs. You don't take away. You sing them the way they're supposed to be sung. Because Miss Wilson wouldn't put up with it. But it was awesome. We're going to watch a video real quick. I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? True, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds. Abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. <coughs> that take you back to your childhood? It ain't Christmas until you watch some Peanuts. Little Charlie Brown. You know, I, I want us to get this perspective this year. I want us to pick up this and adopt it, and I want us to have it in our lives so that those that we come in contact with want to have this philosophy. I want us to have this, don't miss your opportunity to see and be with Jesus. Let that be your, your perspective this year, because I want us to look at some things, and we're going to dive into what that really looks like as we talk through this scripture. But, you know, I think about the, the birth of Jesus, and I think about this scripture right here, and, and God made Jesus' entrance into the world so humble. Do you ever think about that? He made it so humble. Why did he do that? I think he did it so we could realize that we could be with him, that we, that we can be with him. You know, we don't have to go fancy up anything. You don't have to go fix anything to be with Jesus. Now, once you have him, He's going to start working on you. But you don't have to change a thing. Matter of fact, if you wait until you're right to go be with Jesus, you've got the whole thing wrong. I think that's why that, that, that entrance into the world that we read in the story of, of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, I think that's why it is so, so just, so humble. 
so that we can realize that it's for each one of us. Because none of us are worthy to be in the presence of the King of Kings. None of us. Yet here we are, we get this story that if, if it had been anything else other than Jesus, the, the Savior of the world, we thought, man, that poor family, that poor, poor family, the way they were treated and the way they had to go about this, that poor, poor family. But we see it as Jesus and we think, man, People around there probably didn't even have a clue what was happening. They didn't have a hey, they didn't have a real good understanding of what was going on around them in this humble stable. You know, I think about this and I think about our lives, and maybe today you can start to look at your life and maybe maybe we can get it from this perspective. Does your does your life resemble does your life resemble that stable? That stable in Bethlehem that, that, that day, does your life resemble it? Is your life a little dirty? Is it a little dingy? Is it got some crud? Is it a little smelly? Is it not perfect today? Maybe your life resembles that stable that, that, that we read about in this, you know? And I think about, man, that really does, I mean, I've seen some junk in my life. I've, had, I've done some stupid things in my life. I guess if I was going to compare my life to something, it probably a stable would probably be a really good, a good comparison, Maybe a chicken barn, huh, Tom? I mean, because our lives aren't perfect, right? We, we mess stuff up from young age. And we don't stop. Now, we hold other people accountable for what they do, but a lot of times we don't hold ourselves accountable, and, we, and our lives look just like a dirty, old, dingy, stinky, smelly, just a stable. Does your life look like that today? And I read about this Jesus that was born in this manger. I think about that manger. I'm like, okay, you got this stable. I'm telling you, God has just shown it to me in a different light this year. You have this stable, which I'm putting in my mind is like the outside, the shell of this, of this place. It's the shell. It's the outside of things. And you have this manger. It's like in the middle of it. It's kind of like the heart, kind of like your heart, right? What do you have in your heart today? You got, you got trough food you got you got dirt you got dust you got hay what is in there is it it just dirty filthy disgusting in there nothing fit for a king right nothing there's nothing inside of this stable inside of that manger that's fit for a king nothing he's just he's just showing me this year that 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 i need to look at myself as if i was in that stable in bethlehem and if my heart was that dirty old manger Would I think it's fit for a king? Absolutely not. But my God has bigger plans. You know, my heart, it's it's humble nowadays. It hasn't always been. It was a very arrogant heart for a lot of years. But I have a humble heart. It's tattered. It's worn out. It's beat up. I mean, it's not perfect. It's got some clogged arteries in there, I'm sure. But God bless bacon. Right? Right? I mean, thankfully, we don't live under the law. Amen. Jesus fulfilled that law so y'all can eat bacon. Amen. You can't be splitting it both ways on that. But, but God can do the best things with a manger, with a dirty old manger in a beat-up old stinky stable. What can he do with your stable, with your manger, if you let Jesus come inside? What can he do with you? You know, what can we, we don't, I don't know why, I, I mean, I'm sure there's something to this about how God can just do miracles, but we want so often that we're like, yeah, it's just, I don't have time for that. It's Christmas. I've got to get my shopping done. I've got to get the, the groceries ready. I've got to get the house clean. I've got to get everything prepared. I've got to do all these things. I don't have time for Jesus. But God's saying, listen, stop it. Stop your arrogance of Christmas. Realize that you're a beat-up old stable. you got a dirty old manger of a heart, and you need a king in there. You need someone to come in and change it. The person that we resemble the most in this story in Luke 2, you know who we resemble the most? We resemble the innkeeper. We resemble the innkeeper. This message, you want to title it, Kyle, don't be the innkeeper. Change your philosophy. Why, what, do you, what do you mean, Pastor? I don't get what you mean. I mean, it only brings in, like it talks about it for just a second right here in this scripture, right? Verse 6 and 7. While they were there, 
the days were complete for her to give birth. It's time. Babies come when they're ready. You can't stop it, really. When they're ready, they're ready. And she gave birth to her first son, her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, for those of you that are like, I thought Jesus was an only child. He's not. There's a great comedian out there. What's his name, Hayden? Michael Jr. It's funny. I'll share a little bit. You have to edit this out probably because people are all trying to grab Facebook and say they own all this anyway. So, But uh, <laughs> this comedian, he's like, could you imagine being James sitting at the table? And it's always when they pray, it's in Jesus' name. It's in Jesus' name. And Michael Jr., he's like, you know, you can just imagine Mary every once in a while throwing in a in James' name, just to make him feel good there at the table, you know. You got to love good comedy. Michael Jr. is hilarious. But, uh, you know, we, we are more like the innkeeper than we are anybody else in this story. We're more like the innkeeper. Why is that? Because we didn't have room in the inn, right? He didn't have room in the inn. There wasn't time. It was, there was three things I really look at when I read this scripture. I'm not a one, two, three person, but there's three things that really, really jump out at me. It would have been inconvenient, right? It would have been inconvenient to bring Mary and Joseph into the inn. They've already got their plans. They, you know, everybody was come for the census. The place was packed. Everybody that was born from there or come from there was kind of coming back because they had to do the census. So they were seeing an influx of people come back to the city, and there's just, it was a booked up place. Joseph didn't have a Wi-Fi to go on and look for, you know, travelocity or whatever. He had to just, they had to go room to room looking for a place to stay for him and, and his pregnant bride-to-be. And, and here we are, it would be very inconvenient for that innkeeper to let Mary and Joseph come in. It would have been inconvenient. It would have been uncomfortable. It would have been uncomfortable to let him come in. Listen, she's pregnant. They're about to have a baby. I mean, it wasn't a secret. You all know what it's like to, when a woman's about to give birth. You just get out the way. Let the people know what they're doing, do what they're doing, and everybody else get out of the way. It would have been uncomfortable and inconvenient to have that inside the already packed in. It would have been uncomfortable to bring Jesus in there. It would have been uncomfortable because they weren't prepared for Jesus. It would have been inconvenient because, because they weren't told ahead of time what to expect. And you know what it would have also done? That, like, I, think, uh, I think we really need to think about it. It would have required some work to let Jesus come inside. It would have been inconvenient, uncomfortable, and it would have required some work because now we've got to take care of this, this mom who just gave birth. And I don't know, we see these, we see these videos of... of of people that give birth and it's like they're up and running around. It's not the way it works. It takes a few minutes. I get it, ladies. I get it. And I'm not going to be too graphic because I get in trouble. That was two Mother's Day, two Mother's Days, two years ago, Mother's Day. I got in trouble for being too graphic on childbirth, I guess. So if you want to see that, go back on Facebook and look for it. But it's not happening today. Shana gets mad about it. I'm just so proud of her. But, but, but you see that Jesus, it would have been inconvenient to have him in there, him and Mary and Joseph. It would have been uncomfortable to make room for all. So everybody would have had to make concessions to fit a baby, a crying baby, into the house. It would have required work because the baby takes work. Would have maybe lost some sleep because now we, you know, we had this all planned out. We didn't have, you know, we had it all figured out for who was going to come in. And now you want to bring a, 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 a man, his pregnant wife, and, and they're soon, and in, in a minute it's going to be a baby. We're going to bring that inside. It's going to require way too much work. People are going to have to be without blankets because we didn't have enough planned. People are going to have to be without food because we didn't have enough planned. I think we're a lot like the innkeeper sometimes. I think we're too much like the innkeeper. You know, we look at this and we wonder, why, why don't more people want to be followers of Jesus? I mean, it's a great thing. I love following the Lord. He's changed my life over and over again. But I remember back before I was really willing to tell people about the good things, all they ever saw still was like the bad things. 
Because it takes work to be a Christian. But if all we do is talk about, oh, it's so exhausting. Like I keep having to talk with people and deal with people that don't know the Lord. And when I share them, they just look at me like, what do you mean? And they ask more questions. And it's a very inconvenient. It's very inconvenient. And i got to go share Jesus with people that, 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 that don't really want to know him. You know? So I, I, I think that anyway, because that's just what I think. Why would that, why, otherwise, they'd already know him. So now it's going to be uncomfortable. Now I'm going to go talk to strange people. And it's going to require work. I mean, I've already, you know, we've already got jobs. We've already got kids. We've already got all this stuff we've got to do. We've already got this Christmas shopping. We've got this dinners we've got to plan. We've got all these things we do. And now I've got to go share him and, and do all this work. I've got to study because if I'm going to share him with him, I've got to know about him. This is just too much, this knowing Jesus. It's too much. And I think sometimes we, we, we think that in our head. We don't say it out loud because, well, that would be wrong. But we live like that. You don't have to say it for it to be the way you live. We've got to stop being like the innkeeper. We've got to start, we've got to start being, being something different. We don't want to miss our opportunity to be with and see Jesus. You see, the innkeeper missed the moment. The innkeeper missed the moment. While they were still on the premises, they missed the moment, the opportunity to say, you know what, my house is your house. You know what, I'll do without my blanket as the innkeeper. Everybody else can have theirs, you can have mine. I'll stay up a little later and rock the baby so mama can sleep and Joseph can rest. I'll stay up a little bit longer because I realize it's the Savior of the world and it's worth it. I'll get a little more bags under the eyes because I know in eternity I'll get all the rest I ever need. If I know Jesus and he's in my old dirty manger and he's taking care of this stable, someday when this stable's done and it's, and it's just <laughs> whatever, I ain't going to worry about it anyway because I'm going to be in his presence getting all the rest and, and, and joy I'd ever need. And so in this season of life, I want us to shift our perspective over to being the opposite of the innkeeper. How awesome would it be if this, if this verse 7 said, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in the best of clothes that the innkeeper had. And he laid him in the finest of beds that the innkeeper could scrape up. And there was no more room in the place because they gave so much space to the Jesus that was born that day, that they, had to, that they had to start talking to the neighbors about, hey, can they stay over here with you? And they started working together as a community, pulling together because somebody needed help. But if they're willing to do that to the Savior of the world, and we're willing to do that to the Savior of the world, we can say we're not, but too often we're the innkeeper. What would, we've got to change that because what would it look like if we were different? What would it look like if we realized we were a dirty old stable with a messed up manger, but once the King of Kings comes inside... Things get clean. Amen. Things look different. And, and we, may, we won't be perfect, but what's inside of us is. So that tells me that if we just let go, we let God work inside of us, if we accept him, we let him come inside. Let him start cleaning up the manger. And as that happens, the stable starts to look different. And people start to wonder, what is different with that? I promise you that, that if people could find, you know, they say they know where it's at, whatever we go over there. I've not been there, so. But if you walk by that stable now, everybody wants to go inside. Oh, that's where Jesus was born. You know, that's where, Jesus, that's where my Savior was born. How about the day that you get Jesus born into your heart? The day you get saved. The, the day that you have something brand new. You know, when that happens, people are like, I want, I want that. I want that in my life. We don't have to wait till it's an artifact. You don't have to have an obituary someday that says, you know, they lived a really good Christian life. But nobody really knew it. I didn't even realize they were saved until I read their obituary. Well, that's cool. I'm going to get to see them again. How many times has that happened? It's a lot. How many times we go to a funeral and we wonder, did they even know the Lord? We got no clue. 
We've got no clue because all they ever saw was the unchanged stable, the unchanged manger, so they didn't even ask a question. And we didn't share the changes with them. So they don't know. And so we need to change our perspective to line up with what, what God has in Scripture because if we're going to share this baby this, that, that was born sinless, that lived 33 years, died sinless, but took all of our sins away from us if we're willing to give them to him, then, 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 then that, we need to be ready to, sh- to share it. We've got to be ready. You know, I, I read this and it's like in the region the shepherds were staying out in the fields. They're working They're working away. They're doing their job. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, stood before them. I want those moments in my life. And I know we look at things like, oh, that doesn't happen anymore. I promise you. I promise you this. You start following Jesus with everything you have. You start reading scripture. You start really letting him change who you are. You start letting him change who you are as a person. You start letting him do what he wants to do and molding you and shaping you. You're going to see things in your life that the world is going to think is absolutely nuts. And that's okay because it's not about you. It's about what he's doing. And it's not about what do people think of me. You know what? The innkeeper didn't want to upset the other tenants. I guarantee you that's why it was. He didn't want to upset everybody else. The innkeeper's like, well, we're full. I don't want to make these people mad. They're paying me good money. Oh, so money is going to keep you from Jesus. Oh, so inconvenience is going to keep you from Jesus. So being uncomfortable is going to keep you from Jesus. Having to do a little work is going to keep you from Jesus. I don't know about you, but my, my toes are getting stepped on right now. Because I'm realizing right now as I'm, as I'm sharing the word with you, as I'm sharing the message with you, that there's some things I need to change. And if you're sitting here this morning, you're like, well, there's nothing. I'm pretty good. I'm challenged to just dig a little deeper. The story of Christmas is the story of God's relentless, relentless love for us. It's, it, the story of Christmas is about you and me not going to hell. That should be absolutely exciting for you. That should be the most pumped up thing you've got to hear maybe all your life. And and I don't know if you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus, but here's what I'm going to share with you, that, that if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he will do work, but you will do work also. They are both required. You've got to change, he's going to do it. But you've also got to be willing to put in the work. And we've got to stop being afraid of rocking the boat for the other tenants around us. Those sitting in the chair next to you, don't be afraid of them. Don't worry about them. Don't not go to an altar because, well, it's full. You do what God tells you to do, and you do what you know is right to do, and don't let anybody else tell you yes or no. As long as they're aligned with the Word of God, that's all that matters. Those that believe will see the fruits of it and understand. Those that don't won't understand what fruits are anyway. And, and I want us to get pumped up in our perspective of not being the innkeeper this year because i don't want you to miss your opportunity to see and be with jesus there's too many people dying in our world our friends our family that are not going to see or be with jesus because our perspective is too worldly There's too many people that won't be in heaven forever and eternity and be in the new heaven and earth and and be with us with Jesus forever because we are afraid of what other people think of us. We put too much stock in other people's thoughts. We don't ask them for their opinion, but we're afraid of what it might be. So I don't under, that's like the craziest thought, but that's like what it is. We don't ask them what they think, but we're scared to death of what they do think. Yet if we ask Jesus, what do you think? He will deliver a message. He's got lots of them in here. Lots and lots of messages for us. 
And I think when we really start to read, we start to see between the lines. And we see deeper in there. I never thought about my life as being the innkeeper, as messing it up that way. But, you know, until you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you're definitely the innkeeper. You're telling Jesus you got, you got, you're too busy. It's, it's not, there's no room for him in here. But then sometimes we get saved and we still tell him that. Like, like I, I went and did what I was supposed to do. I got saved. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I'm still too busy to really let him come in and change. I'm really too busy to let him come in and do different things for me. And, and I think we, once again, we, we, we read Scripture. We say, oh, I know it. I know. And some of you know Scripture ten times better than I do. I got a terrible memory. I can read something a hundred times and you can ask me what it says and I'll be like, I don't remember. Let me read it again. But that's, but you know what I've learned is, is that as you let Jesus come in and let him shape things and change things, you know what he does? Like if you have Jesus inside of you, this is already in here. It's already in here. You're just studying. So up here understands what he's doing in here. And so I think about this love story that, that, that what Christmas really is, is a love story, a love story for you and me and Jesus. How awesome that he loves us so much. How amazing that, that he would come and be born that, that what seemed to be a helpless baby. So vulnerable in a filthy, dirty stable in an ugly, beat-up, worn-out, tattered manger, a perfect, a perfect Savior laid. And to this day, people want to go and see and, and be a part of, of the history. But they don't want to be a part of the change. Today, I'm going to just challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to not be the innkeeper. I'm going to challenge you not to, to let inconvenience or uncomfortableness or work being done or being afraid of what people are going to think. I'm going to challenge you not to let those things come into your life and change you to where you don't let him come and do his work. I love Christmas. I love everything about it. I love buying gifts. I absolutely love it. I love giving gifts. Wish I had more money to give more gifts. But you know what? I understand that God's given me what he can trust me with, and I get that. And, and, and I, I, just, I just love that what it means. I, I love what it means to love other people the way Jesus loves them. Unconditional. Like that homeless guy at, at Pancakes with Santa. You know, in any other church I've ever been in, they'd have probably been like, you can't be in the children's department. He's making bracelets and eating pancakes with kids, and they're like talking about Jesus, and he's feeling normal for the first time in forever and was going to take his life earlier that day and, and, and didn't because people loved on him like they would love on the people in their life. They didn't think about what the opinions were. They didn't ask what the opinions were. You guys just loved like Jesus loved. You know, most of that was, it was mostly kids. So I want us to go back to our roots, go back to to our childlike faith. That's the roots I'm talking about. That childlike faith. And I want you to not be the innkeeper. I want you to invite him in today bigger than ever. I want you to Ask him to change out some things, to take over the full manger, clean up the stable. You know what's going on in your life. You know what you need him to do. You know he wants to, he wants to take care of that too, but he wants to do all of it, not just some of it. So we're going to play some altar songs. And it's Christmas Sunday. It's the, it's the week that everybody goes to church. As Pastor Hayden says, it's the Keisters, the Christmas and Easter people. Everybody goes to church Christmas week. So it would be a great week for all of us to get ourselves to the best spot we could possibly be.
and let Jesus take over the stable. Let him be in the manger. Let him be the Lord of your life. The altar is yours. Let's give the Lord a hand and some praise this morning. Amen. Folks, we're so glad to have everyone here at Renovation this morning. So this week we're going to have some great stuff. And folks, these altars are going to stay open for a while. So if you have anything that you need to pray about, come up. These things are going to be open and they're going to stay open for a while. Amen. All right, hey, folks, so this week we have going on, we're going to be open. Monday nights are the same, Wednesday nights and Thursday nights, we're eating both nights. So not only are we going to have study, we're going to be eating. So if you guys ever watched that Christmas movie, The Elf, you know, and they ran out of Christmas spirit, and so they had to get the Christmas spirit to get the sleigh off the ground, that we're, I just found out that I'm eating, so my Christmas sleigh just started picking up a little bit. And so the, I'm pretty happy about that. But anyway, um, let's see here. Tara, could you throw that one verse up? And so, folks, before we pray and close, I wanted to just share something with you that kind of went along with Pastor uh, Dustin's sermon today. And so this is a kind of like last week when I told you how nerdy and geeky I get on some of these old messianic prophecies. Let me share this with you real quick. So this uh, this is Micah is one of it's called the one of the lesser prophets from the Old Testament and the reason they call they have greater prophets and lesser prophets is not that one was more important than the other it's just how long the book was okay and so this is specifically from Micah and so that Micah wrote this about 650 to 700 BC so that's about 650 700 years before Christ was born and then, you know, of course, about, about 2,000 until today. So let's read this. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Okay, that's the same Bethlehem that we were talking about today. This is where Jesus was born. This is a messianic prophecy. This right here was talking about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. One thing to think about as you go out this week, and I understand we're all trying to buy presents and get ready to travel and get ready to cook, and I've got to buy hams. I don't know what all I have to buy. But one thing to keep in mind, um, we're lucky enough that we get to show up here this week and we get to freely worship Christ. All right? Can you imagine being in a place where you could not so do? Can you imagine living in a world where there was no Christ? and no hope and yet today even people who don't worship christ get to hang out on christmas day and they get to eat and they get to share gifts and folks what percentage of those people don't have any idea what what christmas is all about amen so as you're going out this week um anybody else have crazy family Oh, you guys that aren't raising your hands are just wrong. Yeah, we know. Amen. And if, and if you don't know who it is in your family, guess what? You're it. But folk, make sure and share this with your family, all right? Because um, they might be the hardest ones to talk to, but folks, they're so important. There is no reason why some of your family should not hear about Christ. Okay? Okay. Um, I don't know how it's going to work, how it's going to sound. Please pass the turkey. And oh, by the way, do you know this Jesus dude? I don't know. Uh, whatever works for you. Amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand and let's go to him in prayer.